Welcome to Pecan Baptist Church. Our vision and purpose is to love God, love others, introduce people to Jesus Christ, and watch them grow in the grace and knowledge of Him, helping them as they lead their friends and family to Christ. We pray that this message will bring you into a closer relationship with God and help you as you live the life He has given to you. We're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and in verse 1 it says, But realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come. And so are we living in the last time? You don't have that amen very often. But, we, but yes, bring about, right? Bring that rapture. We want that rapture of the church to come about. And difficult, if this is indeed is the last days. Now I'll tell you, we're not supposed to focus on the bad things that are going to happen in the last days, but God gave us those things so we could be aware of what's going to happen. He didn't just leave us in the dark. Now, maybe you're a person in here who is saying, well, preacher, preachers have been saying for centuries, this is the last days. He said, my head is doing it again. And at, this is the last days. He's going to come back at any time. Well, God left us with that kind of that imminency, Right? And I've used this analysis before. If you, let's say you owned a restaurant, maybe it's Whataburger or something, and you own a restaurant, and you tell all your employees that you're going to go away for a little while. You don't know when you'll be back. It won't be very long. And you would expect to find them still doing what you're doing. Now, if you did the same thing and you told your employees that you'll be back in maybe 50, 100 years, how would you expect to find your Whataburger when you got back? So he left us with this idea. Now, we have prophecies that I know that we could tell that most certainly we are living in the last times. I think we indeed are in the last days. Now, we could still have revival and delay the whole process. But in the book of Revelation, for example, not until recent times has the technology been there so that this indeed could be the last times. For example, the two prophets that lie in the street that the Antichrist kills, the whole world sees this and celebrates how does that happen? With satellite TV. That's the only way it could happen. People can't travel there and get news can't spread in three days to the whole world. Well, how did John know that? He didn't know that. God told him it was going to happen and God knew it was going to happen. Well, the technology is there for that. What about the mark of the beast? Digital transactions, digital currency, all of those things, that's necessary for the mark of the beast is basically you cannot buy and sell unless you worship the beast. Now, take, take a deep breath. That's after the rapture of the church, right? That's one thing. We have some things that are going to, bad things, are, difficult times are going to come for us, but not as bad as what it is for those that miss the rapture of the church. And so the mark of the beast, that wasn't possible until recently either to track basically the whole world financially, and you can't buy or sell? How did John know that? Well, he didn't know that. God knew that. So the technology is there now. And in Daniel chapter 12, one of my favorite verses, it's talking the resurrection at the end of time. And God tells Daniel, basically people will travel to and fro and information will increase. That's a sign of the end times. Well, we can hop on a jet and be across the Atlantic now. How did Daniel know that, that end of times would have that kind of technology? And then information will increase. Didn't say wisdom. There's a lot of information out there, but sometimes it's really hard to find much wisdom. Well, Jesus said the birth pangs also were going to increase until the end. And those birth pangs are storms, disease, famines, right? Wars and rumors of wars, all those things are going to increase like birth pangs until the end. Can you see an increase in these things? You know, the rate of cancer is just going up and up in spite of all great, I mean, great medical advancements. Cancer in children. When I, when I was young, maybe I was just hidden from it, but I didn't see a whole lot of cancer in children, and it just keeps going up and up. So all of these things are going to increase, and these are difficult times that we're going to go through. So guys, we don't focus on all the negative, right? But we, these things are indicators for us to watch so that we're not left in the dark. And at the same time, Jesus forecasted all these things, and what did he tell us? Do not fear. So we're not, because of all these things, because of these difficult times that we're going into and living in now, we're not to live in fear and frustration as a result of those. Right? We live in the power of the resurrection. He is risen. Oh, you guys. You know, every single day is resurrection day. It's, we just, 
I can do that to you anytime, and you've got to be ready. He is risen indeed, because every single day is resurrection day. So remember, we run to the cross for forgiveness, right? But we run to the empty tomb. We run to the resurrection for, to live in the power of the resurrection, in the light of God's word. And so even though the world is going mad around us, we're not living like that. We're not living in fear and frustration as a result of those things. So now what I'm also hoping, I do want the rapture to come quickly. I think it would be awesome. But at the same time, how wonderful it would be to see revival and delay the whole thing. And then maybe this isn't the last apostasy. You know, Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'm not going to turn there, but he said two things have to happen before the rapture of the church. There was a false teacher that was telling the people at Thessalonica that they had missed the rapture. And Paul says, you haven't missed the rapture. These two things have to happen first. An apostasy. So and there's been apostasies before, but an apostasy. So it's the apostasy of all apostasies. And Jesus predicted this in Matthew chapter 24 as well. So an apost- well, we're living in an apostasy. It could certainly be the apostasy. And there's one other thing that has to happen before the rapture of the church, and that is the appearance of the Antichrist, which is the first seal in the book of Revelation. So what are we watching for? Well, we're watching current events, we're watching the apostasy unfold before our eyes, and we're also waiting and watching to see and looking for the appearance of the Antichrist. And so, I don't know who he is yet, but since Paul said, tells the church that's what you're looking for, then I think, I think we'll know. I think we'll know when it happens, when we see it, and that could certainly be in our lifetime. So now, verse, starting in verse 2 and 4, look at this. For men will, this is talking about the apostasy, right, in the last days. For men will become lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good. It just keeps going. (laughs) Treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of of God. Now, doesn't that sound like a lot of our culture now? And guys, I'm telling you, if you came to me 20 years ago and told me things that are going on now, I would go, there is no way that that would happen. I mean, uh, we've climbed up there right next to Sodom and Gomorrah now, I'm telling you. Maybe we passed them. I don't know. It's just amazing. I wouldn't have believed it in my lifetime. I would have ever seen the things that are going on now. You know, and and God also uses signs in the sky. And you know what's coming up this week. And I think that's that's important. Now, most people are using it as a a travel event or a matter of interest. But God has always used signs in the sky as warnings. Remember at Jesus' crucifixion, there was an eclipse and an earthquake. Right? Do you remember at Jesus' birth, the planets and stars lined up so that the wise men could see what was going on and follow the star, Right? In the past, I didn't say this when we studied Nineveh, but before Jonah went and preached, somewhere around that time, there was a full eclipse in Nineveh. We know that because we can track the clock of the solar system backwards. So I think there probably was. That probably led to their revival as well. Did you know that's going to continue? At the rapture of the church, there's going to be a blood moon, and the sun is going to be darkened. And at the second coming of Jesus, there's going to be the sun and the moon are going to be darkened. So God's going to continue. We say, preacher, we know, we know that this is just the movement of the planets and stuff. Yes, exactly. Now think of the sovereignty of God, that he knew the United States would exist. He knew the United States was going to fall into debauchery at this time, and he created it so that the giant clock of the solar system would make an eclipse at this time over us as a warning. Now, most people aren't looking at it as a warning, I don't think, but I don't think that's a coincidence. I believe it is. I believe God orchestrated it to be that way. So we we should pay attention to the signs in the sky. We should look to the signs of the sky because God is the creator of all. He designed it all with a purpose, intentional. The incredible sovereignty of God. Now look at what verse 5 says. Now I didn't go into detail in a lot of these things. but Well, maybe I should just say this just briefly. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I mean, how the unbelievers and even some professed believers pursue pleasure above all else. Just, it's just fascinating to me. And the debauchery and the wickedness that is going on, which I'm not going to go into details there. 
Then in verse 5, it says, holding to a form of godliness. Now, that word godliness is often used as religion. So look at what it says, holding to a form of religion, although they have denied its power. So there is a lot of religious. Now, you understand religion doesn't save you. Right? What we, our relig- we meet here in worship, and we have lots of ministries in the church, but we do that as a result of our salvation. Like a person can be saved and never be a member of any church or be involved in any church. They can be saved. I don't think they're being obedient, but they can still be saved. And the reason we do what we do, it's a result of our salvation. We're doing it because we want other people to know. We are given the charge of the Great Commission. That's to individuals, that's to the bride of Christ. Now, how are we going to accomplish the Great Commission on our own by ourselves? We aren't. If we do, it's not going to be very effective. That's why we come together as a team to serve the Lord to accomplish the Great Commission, and that's an obedience to Christ. So that's what we're doing here. We're not just getting coffee and donuts, right? So they're hold to a form of religion, but they deny the power of of it. Now think of that. They hold to a form of religion, but they deny its power. Now what are we supposed to be living in the power of? The resurrection. Now this is talking about the same people that are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, right? Treacherous, reckless, conceited, all of these things. Then it says, avoid such men as these. Avoid them. You know, I heard a I heard of about a large church, rapidly growing church, on TV. And I haven't researched it myself, so I'm not going to say which church it is. But I heard that their position was they would never talk about the blood of Jesus or repentance or sin. Because they didn't want to make people uncomfortable. Well, then what are we doing here? I mean, what are we really doing Let's look at verse 6. For among them are those who enter into households and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses. You know, my dad told me one time, he'll be listening to this shortly. My dad told me one time, what differentiates us from the animals? You know, what does an animal do? If it's cold, it looks for a warm place. If it's, you know, if it's hot, it looks for a cool place. If it's hungry, it looks for something to eat. If it wants to breed, it breeds, right? It's whatever it wants, it's love or a pleasure, right? And that's not a sin for them. But what separates us? We are not animals. But people are behaving like animals. And a lot of our children are being raised up to be like animals and told that they are really just glorified animals and nothing more. It's no wonder our young people are going crazy and doing all kinds of wild stuff. You know, here, lovers of pleasure... And thinking of, and I'm not going to go into detail because we obviously have children in here, but manipulation of children and mutilation of children? I never thought I'd see such a thing. What do you think is going to happen when these children become adults and realize what happened to them? Whew. Moving to verse 7, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Just as Jans and Jambres, that's how you say that, opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith, but they will not make further progress. Their folly will be obvious to all, just as Janus and Jambres' folly was also. And so, guys, we are on the inside. We have the Holy Spirit. And so we can see these things. And we know that this is all in opposition to God. We know that. But there's a lot of people that are not believers, and they don't know that it's not in opposition to God. They're just going with whatever the culture is. And a lot of them may be religious Christians, but they're cultural Christians. They're not true believers. They don't believe in Jesus Christ, have trusted him for their salvation, and are living in the power of the resurrection. That's not who they are. They're deceived. And it's obvious now I want to skip down to 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll come back to the verses I skipped. I'm making it easy on you today. We're going to stay on this page. 
after Easter, we had a lot of page flipping on Easter. We're not today. You can stay right here on this page. 2 Timothy 4, first four verses. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. Listen to this. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. So again, he's talking about the last days. And what is a sign of the last days? The people wanting to have their ears tickled, and then teachers not wanting to talk about sin, repentance, or the blood of Jesus, because they don't want to offend anybody. Church is compromising, compromising on marriage, compromising on sin. You know, guys, it would be wonderful. Man, that would be great if I got to decide what sin was and what sin wasn't. Man, that would be awesome. I could decide to do anything and say, no, well, that's not sin anymore. But see, God, we don't have that type of authority. God is the one who decides what sin is. And we don't even have, we don't have the authority to change it, manipulate it in any possible way. And we do not need to be apologetic about it either. It is what it is. God said it, therefore it is. And we're going to follow God. We're not going to follow the culture. We're not going to compromise. Yep, there's a lot of ears being tickled now. And guys, you may, and if you watch televangelist, okay, and you may never hear him talk about the blood of Jesus or sin or repentance, okay, and, but they may say some good things. They may say some good things, but if you're intentionally leaving out that boulder of repentance and forgiveness by the shed blood of Jesus, you're intentionally leaving that out. Well, they may say some good things, some positive things, but they are a false teacher, and I'm not telling you everything I always say is right, but I'm trying to be right by the Lord. And certainly the cross and the shed blood of Jesus is important and repentance is a part of salvation. But if they're intentionally leaving that out, even though they may say some good things, they are a false teacher. So pay attention. Pay attention. If you're watching, you're going to another church or you move churches, pay attention to what is being said. Are they preaching the full counsel? Are they preaching all of it? Are they preaching the parts that you don't want to hear? Right? Or are they just telling you everything you want to hear? Think about it. We do not want to be somewhere where our ears are always tickled. We want to know what God says. We want to be warned about the times that are coming. We want to be corrected if we need to be corrected. We're not going to compromise. So now, if no revival comes, and I pray that revival does, Here's some things that I would expect to see. Now, we look at these things. We look at these things as sign of the times. And it should motivate us even more to spread the gospel through our body and also in our spheres of influence. So if the apostasy worsens, it wouldn't be hard to figure out that we would expect debauchery, sexual sin, wickedness, violence, all of those things to increase. Jesus said, because the love grows cold. And remember what the last church is in the book of Revelation. It's the Laodicean church, which those were seven real churches, seven types of churches, and also seven periods of church history. And the last one is the Laodicean church. Jesus said, at the end in the apostasy, the love of many will go cold. Well, what is the Laodicean church guilty of when Jesus convicts them? They are lukewarm. They are lukewarm. So if the apostasy worsens, we would expect to see all those things. But also the stage is being set for the Antichrist. So what do we need to see? Well, the Antichrist is going to have a one-world government. right? And right now there's this resistance to a one-world government because there's this populist movement that is rising up in Europe. It's rising up here. It's rising up all over the place. It's in resistance to it. But in the end, the Antichrist will have a one-world government. And we can see everything moving in that direction, and I expect to continue to see it unless there's some type of revival. There's going to be a one-world economy. Everything under the control of the Antichrists. There will also be a one-world religion. Now, in order for there to be a one-world religion, then there has to be some incredible compromise. 
there has to be compromise on the religious institutions. And I believe the religious institutions are being prepared for that right now. And we're seeing the religious institutions compromising on things that they shouldn't compromise on. And those that will not compromise are going to be labeled as extremists. Why are we extremists? John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. He is the only way. All religions do not lead to the Father. Only Jesus Christ does. And so, yes, we are extremists because we're unwilling to compromise and say that, you know, it's okay. Everybody has their own God and their own way. No, it's not. That is a lie. So we're not going to compromise there either because Jesus is the way. And we want to see people come that way. So one world religion, I expect to see further and further compromise. I even expect, I even expect that, um, that certain things may come about. Like, I would kind of expected this already, that perhaps the government makes us sign off on certain things, declaring that maybe we'll do same-sex marriage or whatever the case, weddings. And if we don't, we lose our tax-exempt status. I'm kind of surprised that hadn't already happened. So now birth pangs, we expect them to keep increasing. Wars, disease, famines, earthquakes, storms. And guys, this one here, I don't really like much. I don't like any of them, but this one here, listen to this. More hatred for the true church. The ex extremists, the ones that will not compromise. And what will that look like? Well, persecution, violence, maybe tax-exempt status, because we're not going to compromise. Now, false teachers also are going to increase. So we expect to see that. Now, what can we do about any of these things? Like I told you, these things are markers. He gave us these things for a reason, so we can identify the times. It would also give the church a sense of urgency. You know, I think in this country, we have been so comfortable but if these things continue to grow and we become under persecution, the church will get stronger. Our numbers may go down, and I hope that's not you. Our numbers may go down a little bit, but we will get stronger because persecution will make us determined to follow Christ. And it also will show us. Remember the fifth seal. The first seal is the Antichrist showing up, right? And they continue to build up to that point with false teachers. And the second is wars, famines, disease, earthquakes. And then the fourth is the pale horse, which death follows those first three. The fifth one is martyrdom. And the sixth one, I believe, is the rapture of the church. So because of those things, because of the true church that's not willing to compromise, I believe that will drive more animosity toward the true body of believers. But guys, we're promised that God will be there for us. He will never leave us or forsake us. And if God calls one of us to martyrdom, then we'll be home in glory. What can man do to us but fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell? What can anybody do to us? We are the Lord's chosen. We are his family. We are his bride. So no matter what, don't get crazy about what's going on in the world. Understand that God said it was going to happen. We're just seeing it and God told us it was going to happen. Don't you think he's going to take care of his bride? Oh, he definitely will. Now he said it's going to be difficult times. It's not going to be easy but it will be good for you and me. And God is awesome. He's sovereign. He knew all this was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen, and he will take care of us no matter what. Now going to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 10 through 17. Oh, yeah, we got at least seven minutes left. Plenty of time. Now you follow my teaching. Now look at this. So now remember, he's saying these difficult times are going to come. So what do we do in response? Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. So Paul's been through it. Paul's been through these things. And Paul said, God is awesome. But basically what he's saying, he said, so what do we do? We, we follow the word of God. We live in great conduct which God's living in conduct nowadays makes our light shine even brighter in this crazy world that's around us. 
Live by love, patience, pers- I mean perseverance. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and imposters will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation. Guys, what if these things don't come about until our children or grandchildren? Are they going to be prepared? Do, do, are they going to know the scriptures and what's going to happen? We've got to be teaching the next generations, and that's part of what we do here also. And that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now this, script, this verse you probably know, but did you know it was related also to the difficult last times? All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training and righteousness. Now did it say most scripture or did it say the scriptures that you like? It says all scripture is inspired by God, even the ones you don't like or you would prefer to change or tear out or mark out. All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Look at this. So that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So that's our scripture. See, that's what we're going to stand on. We're going to stand on the word of God. No matter what crazy things go around us, we're going to stand upon the word of God. We're going to live by the word. We're going to teach it to the next generation. We're going to spread the word because that's the way of salvation. We're going to live by the word and we're going to live for the word. And even if necessary, we will die for the word. No compromise. It's the word of God. Thank you for listening today. If you'd like to learn more about the ministries of Pecan Baptist Church, go to our website at www.pecan.church or call 682-205-1565. We're located in Granbury, Texas. Services are each Sunday at 10 a.m.